Since 1973, Delia Smith has pursued her method-based, practical, flamboyantly unflamboyant ideas about how to film the process of making food, from the studio-based kitchen to the real location to the online realm. There's not many people like Delia who are not preachy, not patronising. Michael Wynch owns her husband and I were running a magazine for the Daily Mirror and we were looking for a cook. And her agent, Deborah Owen, sent her along and she was wonderful. And so I got a great cook for the magazine and Michael got a wife. All she wants you to do is cook things properly and experience the joys of eating proper food. She's been a kind of domestic science teacher to people who were made miserable and anxious by the middle-class pretentiousness of some TV chefs and to people who wanted to master the basic techniques of cookery but were too afraid to admit that they didn't know them in the first place. She somehow conveys, if I could do it, anybody can. So here, tonight at BAFTA, we're here to celebrate a 40-year TV career. Delia, the name has entered the language, and for good reason. And I think she has blazed a trail. She's done so, firstly, in a shy Laura Ashley frock, but more recently as the, well, the national institution that we all revere. Delia, I can think of no one more worthy of winning the BAFTA Special Award. You are brilliant, you are enduringly brilliant, and we all love you. Delia. Uh, congratulations on this BAFTA Special Award. What more can television do than teach an entire country how to cook? You brought so much more pleasure uh, to the world, really, than anything that I could ever have done. And also, particularly today, I'd like to thank you for your amazing contribution to Comic Relief, not only in breaking the bed with Lenny Henry, but in the millions of pounds that you help us raise at a crucial time. <laughs> Delia, I think it's fair to say when we see those early clips of that rather shy, demure young woman doing her, you know, making her first kind of uh, foray into, into broadcasting, did you ever really expect to have been doing this, to still be doing this 40 years later? No, not at all. It wasn't part of a plan you had then? No. So when you first found yourself in a TV studio in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did you come to be there? What was your, what was your way in? Well, um, it was the BBC were looking for somebody new to present food. And um, I was working on the Evening Standard doing a recipe every day. And so sort of I was sort of in the face of everybody in London. And so they thought, well, let's get her in and see what she can do. And um, I did a little pilot programme, five minutes. And, what did uh, you make? Can you remember? Yes, I think, I think it was something called um, alpine eggs, which you make with cheese and eggs, bake them in the oven. And um, they showed the um, pilot to the um, controller, and he agreed to do a series the day he resigned and had his desk cleared. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite... A, if, he, if, he hadn't, if he'd gone the, next, uh, the day before, I don't know what would have happened. <laughs> And what did you think about it? I mean, do you think, did you see this as a sort of little detour from, from journalism or, or was it something that you wanted to kind of in, in invest a, a lot in? What was your attitude to it in those very first early days? Oh, my attitude was what an opportunity because to be able to teach people, you know, through this wonderful media of television was like in another place. So it was, you know, I was very, very keen and very enthusiastic. And the first show that you worked on was called Family Fair mm -hmm. in 1973. F-A-Y. Oh, right, yes, excellent, <laughs> of course, yes. So what sort of, what was the setup there? What kind of, um, what kind of technology were you dealing with? What was the studio like? Well, I was, I was um, invited by a department called Presentation, and Presentation did um, a couple of programmes and the weather. And um, actually, they did some really good programmes, but... Um, the weather studio was very tiny and they asked me to do my series there and the nearest running water was the ladies' loo. <laughs> so we used to fill two buckets with water, one soap, one rinsing and have them under the counter where I worked. And there was a counter that went along there like that in an L shape and they didn't have the money for editing so I had to do 25 minutes, 40 seconds all in one go and if I didn't, if I made a mistake, I'd have to start at the top. 
so it was very important not to make any mistakes and have to go through it all again. And there were four cameras that kept bumping into each other. Um, and they didn't really, they weren't really able to see inside casseroles and things like that. So I always had to lift things and point them to the camera. And also they didn't do any close-ups because my hands were shaking too much. <laughs> were you nervous? I mean, was it very, something Very, very that... nervous. And um, I, one recipe was a, a poached trout. And to lift it from the little bath of wine and stuff, mm. it, I had to have two fish slices. And as it was going to the plate, both my hands were shaking. And the trout's head was just about to <laughs> drop off <laughs> as it went down to the plate. And what were you cooking on? Because something tells me that the weather studio wouldn't have come, wouldn't have had access. If it didn't have running water, what was the, what was the, sort of, what was the equipment like? Well, they did put in, you know, a hob mm. and... Uh, but one that you were happy with, one that you could work with uh, yes. effectively. Yes, and I mean, you know, it was limited to what we could do. I mean, I, c I can't believe they gave me a series, really, but they did. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the, the relationship with the camera? I mean, how did that work? Because this is multi-camera television, isn't it? There's a kind of a ballet of, of technicians going on around you. Or perhaps it was not as complicated as that. No, cameras were absolutely fantastic for me. I was made for cameras. If you put me before a live audience to cook, I couldn't do it. Because um, if you're cooking, you've got to entertain as well, because you know it takes sort of six minutes to beat up egg whites or something. And um, I, I can't do that. So therefore, a camera, you know, a bored cameraman with his, with his yachting weekly propped up at the end <laughs> was, was, was just my speed, you know? It strikes me that one of the secrets of your success is that you're, you're not kind of a turn. You're not a kind of, um, you know, you're not kind of willfully eccentric in the way that some uh, TV presenters are encouraged to be. You're sort of a kind of real resistant to that sort of idea of making television. Yeah, girl next door is what my agent says. I <laughs> The girl next door. But is that something that you thought about consciously? No, it's just that I, I, I wouldn't be capable of being anything else. So therefore, it had to be the food that was the star because I wasn't going to be, you know, a star in that way. So that's a kind of a, of a happy coincidence yes. in a way, isn't it? But there's something about the kind of food that interests you and the way that you want to, to show it to us that does feel like it's kind of rather opposed to that sort of galloping gourmet way mm -hmm. of doing things. This isn't yeah. kind of making food as theatre, is mm -hmm. it? And that's, that strikes me that must be... That's a kind of a thought through idea. Yes, it is, but it's because that's how it really is. I mean, food isn't theatre, um, and I think to make it into theatre is wrong. And I think it, you know, it can speak for itself, and it's wonderful, and it's beautiful, it's art, it's everything. <coughs> and therefore, um, I don't think it needs that kind of embellishment. And I think our problem is we, we don't think highly enough of it, and so we think we've got to wrap it up in all kinds of other things. But it's interesting how old that idea of having to kind of turn it into a form of entertainment for television is. I mean, it predates mm -hmm. you by quite some period, doesn't it? I mean, the kind of things that Fanny Cradder yes. used to do. She used to put shows on yes. in the Albert Hall. Yes. Um, and in a sense, that it's that kind of thing that, you know, mm -hmm. that's just not you, that sort of thing, is it? No, no. And... Uh, that's, I mean, that's how it was, and I suppose, really, you know, um, it's a bit of a, a miracle, really, that people would watch it. <laughs> so what kind of response did you get from the audience? I mean, did you find that immediately people were, were responding to this and writing into you? Yeah, very much so. And that's really how I learned to write, and that's how I've learned to, to demonstrate cooking, because people let you know what it is they they want to see and what they appreciate seeing and it's very much involved in in reaching people and when they communicate back that's when you learn and what did you sense that they were getting out of it what did they want to know how to cook mm. <laughs> and that this was something that they were afraid to to to, do. to ask to, to do or to ask about yes, yes when i started people if they wanted to learn to cook then they had to go out to night school. Um, you don't hear of night school now, do you? Mm. People used to go out to night school, and I thought, wow, why not you know, teach them on television so they don't have to go out on a cold, dark, wintry night? 
um, and just have it beamed into their, into their room. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have been able to do. So it's a kind of open university idea, almost, then. No, I wouldn't put it on that level. <laughs> when I was learning to cook myself, I absolutely adored and idolised and worshipped Elizabeth David. And I still do. But she often left me wondering. I didn't know what she meant, and I didn't know how to do it. And so, yes, I did, I did sort of pick up, up on that and think, well, I want to fill in those gaps, you know, and make it so no stone's unturned. A person is going out, before they cook, they're going out and spending money on ingredients. So they bought the ingredients and they've come home. It's got to actually work. And it's got to be easy for them and trouble-free and give them confidence. So that's, that's what the aim was. Elizabeth Davis' recipes reflect something of, of what she got up to in her life, don't they? They're almost a kind of... Uh autobiography. I mean, where, where have your recipes tended to come from? What's the basis of it? Is it, is it from your family background or yes. from your... Yes. Yeah, I, I was brought up on good food. My mother was a fantastic cook and a lot of what's in the cookery course is what she taught me. Um, so, and, you know, I, I was in a family where both my grandmothers, you know, were good cooks and, and rated good food. And so we were brought up with lovely wonderful food and we didn't have holidays abroad but we had you know nice recipes made with butter and <laughs> what's your sense of, of why people might become estranged from cooking i mean if this is this is something we hear talked about a lot but if this is something that an idea that you're sensitive to 40 years ago i mean what what are the forces shaping this do you think how did we get to that position history history we um in the 18th century, the people in this country were eating as well as anyone else in Europe or anyone else in the world. But this was followed by an industrial revolution where we lost our links with the land. And it's country, it's in the country that good cooking happens. The handing down of cooking from mother to daughter was interrupted. We get to the end of the war. Um, we're living on chips and margarine and um, nobody really knows what to do so we've got glossy color supplements on uh, uh, magazines and newspapers or we've got the other end of the scale and we've got you know sort of family magazines doing recipes with cornflakes and yeah. things like that so you know that that was my vocation really to try and sort of get in there and put it back on the map it's interesting that you should be doing it at that moment, though, because, yeah. you know, 1973, a lot of people are kind of feeling discontentment about industrialised society. Aren't this is the moment when, you know, self-sufficiency becomes popular, yes. when, when a, there's a kind of resurgence in craft, too, yes. isn't there? I mean, did you see it as part of, of that sort of turn? No, no it was, it's not as complicated as mm. that. I just love food and cooking, and I want everybody else to love it. So <laughs> the first series came to a sudden end, didn't it? I mean, there were well, the first series, Family Fair, I think we did three. Did 33 three? episodes. 33, we did three series. Mm. Um, and I think, I think what happened is they, they, they sort of sensed it was popular. So they did what they often do, and they, put it, they thought, oh, we'll put it on a, a really big audience. So they put me at the end of Nationwide, which had, I don't know how many million people. And then as soon as Nationwide finished, about, you know, so many million switched off. <laughs> so they didn't think I was really the audience puller that, that I might have been. And so they, they hived me off to BBC Two. That was BBC One. Then I went off to BBC Two, and the person who gave me a series on BBC Two was um, Michael Attenborough. Uh, he was controller of BBC Two, or caretaker controller. Um, and then the next controller of BBC Two said, this isn't sexy enough. I don't think it belongs on my channel. I think it should go to um, education. And they had a department called Further Education then. And um, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. But Thank God I wasn't sexy enough. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I mean, to be told that, I mean, was that bit of a blow. Well, yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> but, you know, can't be everything, can you? <laughs> it seems to me that um, 
that there are there are kind of lots of things that you're bringing to operation that are deliberately designed to to reassure us in a way uh -huh. to assure us that we can do this too this isn't yes. some exotic alien process yes it's the it's actually um what i'm what i'm about you know um i never think of myself as being a fantastic cook that turns out dishes where people are gasping and saying wow isn't that wonderful but i it, it is enabling others to learn what i've been able to learn is what it's about that's all it's about after the cookery course um it was so successful, so incredibly successful. And I thought, well, I've done what I wanted to do now. I've been able to teach people to cook. That's what I wanted to do. And I'm going to go for something a minority. I wanted to go for something minority that hadn't been done. And a man came up to me in a supermarket one day, and he said to me, Delia, he said, I love your recipe for pate, but I live alone. And he said, I can't, um, you know, I can't make all that pate just for one. When are you going to do recipes for one? And so click in my mind, it went. And I thought, now that's a good, good service to do to the community, is do recipes for one. And I thought it would be minority. Um, but actually, it wasn't minority. A lot of people were living on their own. And a lot of people found it you know, helpful. And it became a huge bestseller as well. When you came back to television, did you find, you know, what had changed in, in the interim? What did, you, what did you know when when coming back that you didn't know when you started? What were you, were you able to sort of put into practice? I don't, I don't really remember being away for that long because One is Fun was supposed to be a book. Mm. And then um, I met somebody from the BBC who's here tonight, and he said... Um, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just doing a book now. And he said, oh, I think that should be television. And I said, no, it's too late. Book's coming out in June. And this was like sort of March or sometime. And he said, no, I think it should be on television. And he was controller of Manchester, Roger Bolton. And uh, he said, no, we'll get it on television. We can do it. Because we had to do it really quickly. I had a friend of mine who was a designer. And I said, oh, let's do something crazy. And so let's do it all on a black background. And then I was told, no, you can't do it on a back. It doesn't work. Lighting, you can't light on a back, black background. So I said, yes, you can, because Mastermind is always done on a black background. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to do it on a black background. And this friend of mine who's a designer, we just put lots of color in it and just made it black, did a lot of color. And then one of the viewers, when we'd finished it, said, it looked as if I was cooking in a nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite a conscious move away from that artificial studio kitchen, isn't it? This is a sort of studio that acknowledges that it is a studio. It's not pretending to be I yeah. know, like Dorothy Slight Holmes Farmhouse Kitchen. No, I think you've for got, older you, older viewers. <laughs> I think you've always got to try and move on. You've always got to try and you know do something different. And how have you felt about because the way that the grammar of these programmes has shifted? over the years has been I mean they've increasingly become they increasingly became more naturalistic didn't they the camera we go out of the studio yep. we then move into a real a real location don't we beyond mm -hmm. the studio walls I mean, yeah. does that feel like a good move to you well it is a good move because studio things have sort of a deadness to them and cooking is is about life and living and I found that when we created the conservatory that you had real life going on. You know, you had the wind blowing, you had, you know, a lot of problems maybe with noise and sound, but it looked like real life. And I think that was a very, very important part of, um, of, of, of growing and, and making it more, more real, really. At some point in this conversation, this was going to come up, and I, I know it's awkward, I know it's difficult. There's probably a word that goes with it. It might be Deliagate. Um, have you found that because of the, the, the influence that you exert and the popularity of your books and shows, that what you do is subject to a kind of scrutiny that maybe others don't have to endure? Yes, yes. And how do you find that? What do you make of that? Oh, it's a pain. <laughs> the press call me Cranberry Queen. 
But actually, um, it, is, it is not really about me. If you put two and two together, it's television. It has power. It's in people's homes. And if that's being beamed into people's homes, and there was this fruit that people didn't really understand and know what to do with, and, you know, I wanted them to understand how wonderful it was. And I was able to do that on television. And everybody went out and bought cranberries, and that was wonderful. And um, the American embassy invited me around one day and gave me an award. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I don't know whether you can really write yourself totally out of this uh, equation. There are hundreds of cooking shows on TV. This doesn't happen with ev to everybody. Well, I think... First of all, people trusted me by then, because I'd been around a long time, mm. even then. And I think, um, also, let's let Cranberry speak for itself. You have a good <laughs> photographer, and you film it, and you show how beautiful it is, then, you know, it's, it's, it, it's got a, a role to play here, just speaking for itself. Coriander, I think. There was a bit of a run <laughs> on coriander, too, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, limes and coriander with summer collection. But, I mean, don't you think that is a measure of something that... Uh, a measure of the trust that people have in you? Well, it is a measure of trust, yes. But, I mean, what I found straight away, very early on, is in all my researches, you know, things that... Um, you know, we once had a pastry cutter that you could roll pastry and make it into lattice. And that was, you know, a big phenomenon. I mean, you know, and I discovered that in a, in a, in a kitchen shop selling kitchen wares uh, for chefs, professional. And, you know, why should it be that only chefs in smart restaurants know about all these various things? Somebody like me comes along and says, well, we can all be using that. And it's true. So you need somebody who's going to sort of stand up for the rest of the world and not, you know, think that it's the exclusive territory of chefs in posh restaurants. Mm -hmm. Now, the way you say that, chefs in posh ah. restaurants, I, I, detect very a, revealing. I detect a tone there. Well, let me just tell you about, about when I was learning to cook, I used to go on pilgrimages. I used to go to France and just go there to a restaurant just to taste the food that the chefs were cooking and how wonderful it was. And I can't say enough. We need chefs. You know, we need birthday parties and we need special occasions. We need lovely restaurants. But we also need to cook at home. And all I'm saying is that what's happened now is home cooking's been eclipsed by chefs. It's been driven off the horizon. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's a shame. Do you think because of television, people are kind of trying to run before they can walk as far as food is no, concerned? No, I don't think they're even walking. How to Cheat was because um, people were not having time to cook and busy lives. And it was never meant to replace cooking. It was only meant to be on the days when you haven't got time. You have a good sort of larder and you can use good ingredients. You know, it's really funny how um, there are certain sections of the media that don't know how to listen before they burst into print and headlines. And um, it, was, it was a nightmare, really. It was a total nightmare, um, the way people went for it. And, uh, but it was no OK for me, because I was writing for a section of the public uh, who needed it. And those people bought it, and those people still mm. use it. And that's what it was for. So that's, it doesn't really matter what the press said. That's what it was for. But I did have a little bonus that I wasn't expecting. And I had a lot of letters from handicapped people who said that they had been unable to cook until this book had come out and it had cut down on all kinds of things like chopping. And, um, you know, having that mini chopper meant, you know, if you didn't, if you couldn't use a knife. And so that was a little bonus, and I'm very proud of that. And we've got beautiful communications that people sent us. I mean, how would you describe your relationship with, uh, with your readers and your viewers? What role do they play um, in, uh, in what you do? How have they shaped what we've seen you doing on the screen? Completely shaped it. Because they communicate, I've learned, I've learned how to write recipes from people who 
are using them and people are saying to me, you didn't say that or you left that out. Now, some people would say, oh, it's really boring reading Adelia Smith recipe because she tells you all the things you know. But I write them for people who don't know. So it's OK. <laughs> I mean, are you now kind of a post, post-televisual person? Is television something that you have, have left behind now? I haven't. At the moment, if I think in terms of television, I think there's still a gap. I don't think people are learning the basics. And maybe they wouldn't want to now because they want to be entertained on television. But I, I think um, I'll stop. You know, when I've done this, I'll stop because it'll be done then forever. You see, I, I spent a lot of work on how to cook. It was, a, it was three books. It was a lot, a lot, a lot of hard labour. And then I don't think it even got repeated, some of it. You know, then it's all gone. Whereas what I'm doing now is there forever. And what can you do in this form that you can't do um, in a TV format? Well, you, you can decide what you want to show and what's important to show without anyone saying you can't. So is it more a, oh, was it more a kind of um, an aspect of wanting an editorial control of being able to kind of shape your own no, work? No, it's just a desire to communicate. It is a desire to communicate a subject that I believe in passionately and um, to reach people who are afraid. That's the whole point. And it's easier perhaps to reach people through you know, a device they might be carrying around in their pockets all the time. Yes, exactly. Them. On the bus, on the way to school, <gasps> on the beach, I've said, you know, wherever you are, if you want to, if you want to have a look, if you want to know, you know, if you arrive home with a cauliflower and you don't know how to cook it, have a look. So how it strikes me that the sort of informing ideas of your career have remained extremely constant. It's just the technology has changed. That has changed yes. around it. Yes, there's, there's always been that, you know, desire to, um, going back in history to those days and those, the Industrial Revolution and the two world wars and that interruption um, to try and sort of do something about it and put it back. I'm going to throw this out to you now. We have roving mics. Yes, there's a question at the side there. Um, when I was 10 years old, I was on Junior MasterChef, and I actually wrote you a letter to tell you that you were my culinary inspiration. Um, and I'd just like to know, who would you say currently is your current... Well, who or what is your current culinary inspiration? Did you get a reply? You know what? I actually brought it with me. Oh, oh. go on, go on, tell us. Yeah, go on. Yeah. You sent, me, um, you sent me a copy of your winter collection, you signed it, and you also wrote me a letter as well. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> culinary inspiration at this moment nobody at the moment but I have got a lot a, a collection of culinary inspirations in my house the people who've inspired me most are obviously Elizabeth David Robert Carrier Katie Stewart um, Simon Hopkinson I mean he's my favourite chef because he's not really a chef, he's a cook, you know, that's, that's why I like Simon Hopkinson. <laughs> um, and also, because, because I've done all this work all these years, the last thing I want to do in my spare time is watch a cookery programme. <laughs> <laughs> yes, something like that. This isn't really a question, it's to say, I've sat here just being absolutely bowled over by how wonderful you are, and I feel <laughs> like what you've expressed, your spirit, Totally unpretentious, totally undemocratic. I only came because my sister-in-laws, who are both really good cooks, and my mum are here. So we came on a girls' night out, and I thought, well, I've always sort of wanted to know what all the fuss is about with Delia Smith, but I was secretly dreading it, thinking I've got too much work, I can't possibly, I know nothing about cupcakes. And I just wanted to say, I am totally going to subscribe to every single lesson I possibly can. <laughs> oh. And I can't believe it's taken me all my life to, to get to sort of, you know, to, to get it. But I really get it, so thank you. Can I say wow. something to you? Yeah. <laughs> I'd just like to say something to you. 
you have completely made my day. <laughs> Well, I think these are excellent sentiments that will lead us into our final uh, montage of clips, which I think might be, you know, you've seen all the material before um, upon the screen app, but I don't think you will have seen this because um, you set out to teach people to cook. Um, there's going to be evidence on this screen uh, in a moment of, uh, of how successful that process has been. Trawled from YouTube by our producer, all of these people have been inspired to do Adelia. Can we have a clip, please? <laughs> How to bake that pie with me, Delia Smith, showing you how to bake that pie, apple pie pie. Hello, we are making Delia Smith brownies. Hi guys! So today we will be making freaking Delia Smith pancakes, oh yes! I will be channeling the spirit of Delia Smith today to help us in the construction of the sponge cake. Delia, are you there, love? Excellent. Again, you may just more than one sponge cake today. And first of all, we need a nice big bowl. 110 grams of flour. 200 milliliters of milk mixed with 75 milliliters of water. Yay! It's weird how the chocolate's like separated <laughs> from the butter. <laughs> You just simply stir this round. And so it should simply look like this. So just keep whisking. Don't worry if it goes wrong. At the end of the day, it's all about the pie, not about how it looks. <laughs> No. Just See what she has to say first. I'm clutching my special Delia Smith's book of cakes, which a bit like an old copy of Lady Chatterley's Lover. <laughs> it falls open at chocolate fudge brownies, which is the only thing I ever make. <laughs> Though I've realised now where I'm going wrong with my pastry is I've been rolling out instead of easing in, and I won't do that anymore. Um, I think the words national treasure are overused and many people would like that title who are not really entitled to it. I think we can all agree Thora Heard was a national treasure and when she died I think that that throne was empty for a while. I think Judy Dench was hopeful <laughs> and then Joanna Lumley came up on the rails. <laughs> Judy Dench is very bitter about this apparently. <laughs> Yeah, she sits at home with a fag and a can of lager. <laughs> going, wish I'd thought of saving the bloody Gurkhas. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I think we can agree that Delia Smith, with her marvellous contribution to nutrition, our happiness, to communication, to television, to democracy, truly deserves the word, national treasure, and I'm so thrilled, Deal, tonight to be able to present you with your special BAFTA award, and now you can come up and get it. <laughs> well done. <Hi. laughs> well done. Thank you. I really did think that only people in movies got BAFTAs. <laughs> and so I'm very excited, and I just want to say um, a huge thank you to BAFTA for even thinking of me. I mean, like, it is quite overwhelming that they should, and I'm, I'm very proud and very privileged. And of course, I want to say thank you to all the people who have helped me to do what I've done, what you've seen this evening. All the people like my mum who taught me to cook, my husband Michael who's been behind me and everything I've done and very much part of it all, and Debbie Owen, my agent. The, the, the current team I'm working with now who are here this evening, who are helping me, they know who they are. And everybody who's helped, the producers, the directors, the cameramen, everyone that's helped me uh, through my career 
I want to say a warm thank you to, um, and thank you all tonight for coming and sharing this with me. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you so much. That's lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Julia Smith. Yeah. Yeah.